It's beginning to look a lot like Christmas Soon the bells will start And the thing that will make them ring Is the carol that you sing right within your heart It's beginning to look a lot like Christmas 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 It is beginning to look a lot like Christmas, especially after hearing my next guest. Welcome back to The World Over. Of course, that was Johnny Mathis. This year marks his 60th anniversary in the recording industry, and he's one of the most iconic voices anywhere. He released his first album in 1956 and recorded his first number one single, Chances Are, in 1957. Since then, he's landed 50 hits on the Billboard charts and sold millions of records all over the world. He's particularly known for his Christmas albums. His first one is still among the top 10 Christmas records of all time. I sat down with him recently in Los Angeles to discuss his amazing career, how he's managed to keep the purity of his voice at the age of 81, and how the love of family has shaped and sustained him all these years. Here's my exclusive interview with the legendary Johnny Mathis. And here you are, 60 years of singing, Johnny. I mean, recording, this is the 60th anniversary of your recording career. The longest running artist at Columbia. When I went back and looked, you mentioned your father, Clem, who was really a hardworking man, raised seven children. Seven children. You said you learned music from him. You learned singing, the love of singing, really, to please him. What I have never seen anywhere is, what did your father sound like? Did he sound like you when he yes. sang? Yes. He did. We could be twins. <laughs> really? <laughs> yeah, my dad and I sounded like, but dad sang very quietly. He never sang too much. And of course, that's because, first of all, the type of songs that he chose to sing were very, um, he called them sweet songs. Hmm. I said, oh, please. <laughs> I don't want to sing sweet <laughs> right, songs. <laughs> right. And uh, my dad was my hero, my best pal, my mentor, my everything that you could ever ask for in a friend. Hmm. My dad was to me. Tell me, as a young boy, your father took you, I guess the club is the Black Hawk Club in, uh, in San Francisco. You really got to not only see one-on-one, -on -one, but meet some of the greatest jazz artists, really, of our time. All time. Ella Fitzgerald, Nat King Cole. Tell me about his influence on that Johnny Mathis sound it, and what it would become. It formed my personality as far as what people thought about someone like myself who was in the spotlight. Mm. I was never so amazed at how gracious and kind those people, Nat King Cole, Ella Fitzgerald, Sir uh, Lena Horne, uh, uh, Dizzy Gillespie, uh, mm. Miles Davis, all of these extraordinary people who were very complex, mm. had so many things in their lives uh, mm. that were, uh, you know, and now I realize that because I'm in that position. Mm. But they were so kind to me and so generous with their time that I swore if ever I got, you know, made like it that, <laughs> I was going to be nice to people because it felt so good to be with them and, and they would share their, their little, uh, you know, day-to-day -day activities with me. My dad was... Uh, was very instrumental in, in bringing me there because they didn't allow children, of course, in right. nightclubs. But uh, once we got there, uh, Dad would always find a way to sit in the corner. And uh, when they were passing by, these people would stop and shake my hand. And wow. Ella Fitzgerald and Sarah Vaughan and I. <laughs> <laughs> and then, of course, when I started to sing and got to to actually go to a lot of these same places that they performed in mm. and even uh, hook up with them. Right. And I, ah, what a, what a joy it's been my, my whole professional life. All I had to do was to keep my focus 
and uh, I had a lot of people helping me. That's hard for people to do though, particularly when you're in the public eye and there's so many demands. The focus is very difficult because there's so many things that, that you're asked to do, which just because you can sing doesn't mean that you could <laughs> do anything oh, else. Yeah. <laughs> Let's go back to 1956. You start recording at Columbia. And before long, really your second album, Mitch Miller begins to shape your career. What impact did he have? on your sound and on the type of music that you would then embrace? Not because he was such a, a, a gentle, kind, goddess type of person, because <laughs> yeah. he was not. He was not, no. <laughs> he, he, was, he was a businessman who uh, was in charge of people like Tony Bennett and, and uh, Rosemary Clooney and uh, uh, goodness knows how many other... Sinatra. Uh, bunch of, Sinatra, yeah. yes. Sinatra... Had just flown the coop. Yes, he, yeah. he, he got out of there. But Mitch was a, a, a very famous oboist in uh, the New York Symphony. And so he had the classical upbringing, and we'll let you know about it. Uh, he thought that my voice was okay, he says, but you're singing all the wrong songs because we uh, are a company and uh, we've invested our money in you and we want you to be successful and you won't be successful singing jazz because there's no money in it. People don't pay to go see jazz and, and, and all these things that everybody, you know, mm -hmm. eventually told me. Uh, and he uh, uh, gave me a, he gave me a stack of records about like this and said, pick out four or five songs and we'll go in and record them. And I did and I picked out it's not for me to say when Sunny gets blue. Wow. Um, a couple of more, and uh, we were. But you studio. picked those out. I assumed yes. he picked those out for you. No. no. Later on, that was later on. Uh -huh. He owned the publishing rights on some of the songs, so he, he would <laughs> slip them to me. <laughs> I'd sing them. You know, it doesn't matter. They were good songs. 1958 was a very big year for you, and Christmas. That was when you you released your first Christmas album. Is it? That yeah, with Percy Faith. When you listen to that album, you think what? Mom and Dad. Mm -hmm. That's why I recorded it. Uh, they always made Christmas special uh, with no monetary means at all. Uh, they both worked very hard, but they worked as domestic workers, and mm -hmm. there wasn't very much money in that. And with seven children, and usually at our house, we had uh, people passing through from the south is where our, my family originated. But mom and dad, um, were, they always made Christmas special. <laughs> we'd, we'd take these old stockings that mom had thrown away or something and fill them with fruit and, and candy and what have you and hang them over the pretend fireplace. It wasn't <laughs> a real fireplace. And yeah. uh, that, to me, was the time when the family was together Mm. Uh, when I saw my mom and my dad for the first time, you know, doing something together because we were all over the place. They were trying to make a living for seven kids, if you can imagine. Sure. I remember the first time that my mom had ever sat down and listened to me sing. And I, it was almost always at Christmas time when my dad wow. would teach me a song or two. So, yes, Christmas was everything to us. And mm. when I had a first a couple of hit records, somebody asked me, what would you like to sing now, Mr. Mathis? <laughs> I said, I'm sing some Christmas songs for my mom and my dad. <laughs> and that's the way that happened. I love that. What about Percy Faith? How did that relationship happen? Because those arrangements and orchestrations are just... God not... bless Percy Faith. Mm. Percy Faith was a working artist at Columbia Records, mm. a very, very important artist. Uh, I thought of him as because of he, there was no singing. Right. So I said, well, he makes arrangements and what have you. <laughs> so <laughs> I asked him to make my arrangements. <laughs> he understood my ignorance, and he was very kind to me, and he listened to a couple of songs that I had done. I was amazed and thrilled. He was a taskmaster. Mm. I used to ask him, how do you think I should sing this? He said, 
Sing it the right way, kid. <laughs> <laughs> oh. Let's talk for a moment about this voice. Johnny, it's, it's now been 60 years since the country, the world, first heard your voice. The tone, the quality of your voice has really not changed. How do you maintain that? How have you maintained it? It was too high. The people who sang, the men who sang, when I was a kid, mm -hmm. were Billy Eckstein, Perry Como, oh. Bing Crosby. Bing Crosby, my dad worshipped Bing Crosby. He wanted me to sing every song Bing Crosby ever recorded. <laughs> my sound was too high. I was not pleased. But I started singing very early. Mm -hmm. And of course, I had uh, this little choir boy sound. Um, and fortunately, I found a teacher who said, we don't want to change that. All we want to do is make you do it properly so that you can always do it. And later on, when, you're, when your voice gets uh, bigger, mm -hmm. then you, you'll be able to do that. But if we don't learn it now, and of course it was a very, very difficult time because my voice was changing. Yeah. One day I'd go and I sounded like this, <laughs> and the next day I sounded mm -hmm. like this. And I cried, I wow. cried. Mm. I, I used to sit in a corner and when she'd take her other students, you yeah. know, and I'd say, oh, uh, I don't know what's wrong with me. And she would smile and say, dear, don't worry, you'll be okay, you'll be okay. Mm -hmm. the, f the flexibility, though, Johnny, over time is an amazing, I mean, you go into your falsetto, then you're dropping into the low bass range. I mean, it really is an astounding thing. And there's something I've observed, I've watched you as an audience member on television, but certainly live. You move your jaw in a certain way. And I always thought, I mean, you really work, your jaw moves in unpredictable ways when you're singing. I used to think that was to accommodate the tone <laughs> and the beautiful sounds no. you were making to sort of move that tone into this place to resonate. You know what it was? It's not. No. When I was a child, as most poor children are, they go to the dentist, and if you have a cavity in your tooth, mm -hmm. they pull it. Yeah. Or in those days. Uh, so I had several ca cavities in one side of my mouth, and they took all my teeth out. And so it made my mouth lop jaw. So I, in order for me to open my mouth, I had to do like that. Oh, my god! Yeah. It was uh, quite traumatic for me to watch myself in the early days. Wow. And I, um, I said, I don't know what to do. So as time went on and um, dentistry uh, caught up mm -hmm. to the world, hmm. uh, I was told uh, that there was some help for me. Hmm. And uh, I found a wonderful dentist who uh, straightened things out for me. Isn't it interesting, though, that this, something you wouldn't ask for, you know, something a, a, a child didn't desire, it ended up shaping your tone and the making your sound. Yes, yes. And it's what we remember, it's what you produce even now, mm -hmm. is that same sound. I mean, that's, that's gotta be a curious thing <laughs> for you. Yeah, all sorts of wonderful things happen on, uh, out of an unfortunate situation. Right. Yeah. For instance, how many people of great, you know, importance in the world have come from humble beginnings? And uh, it, it makes us all quite humble, I think. I've always thought the reason that Johnny Matheson Christmas always fits so well is because you do have that inner spirit of joy, of giving, of humility that sort of shines through the singing. Are you aware of that? My whole life, I wanted to please my parents. My parents, to me, and I can't understand why more people don't celebrate them, mm. um, I mean theirs, they were the kindest, nicest friends, mm. companions. They were everything to me. And I wanted to do something. I didn't know what. And then we found a wonderful lady who taught me we were free of charge, no charge. Wow. She had faith in me as someone who would continue my, uh, my studies mm. over the years, and she had several students like that. And that was Connie Cox, Connie Cox. lovely lady over in the uh, 
East Bay area of San Francisco. And uh, I worked with her, fortunately, from the time I was 13 till about 18. Mm -hmm. But that is through the kindness of others. I am here today. Wow. And then, of course, it has to start with the family. Right? That's exactly right. Mm -hmm. Tell me about the routine that you, at 81, continue. You have a very rigorous routine. People don't realize singing is not just one thing. It's your whole body. <laughs> Everybody tells you that when you're young. And you say, well, ah, it's OK. Mm -hmm. You're singing OK. Doesn't bother me. Uh -huh. And then you get older. And then things start to be a little bit more difficult. Uh -huh. Fortunately, I was a high jumper and a hurdle on the track team. And there's no other way you can do what you do, you know, physically like that, unless you exercise. Right. I got accustomed to exercising. Um, for the last 20 years, I've been up at 4 o'clock in the morning and uh, wow. do what I do, go to the gym for an hour, uh, come home, feel wonderful after that, of course. Yeah. Then it goes downhill a little bit, because <laughs> I am 80 years old, my goodness. It's yeah. unbelievable. And you do that on show days, too? Yes. You're up at 4 o'clock and you're performing no, 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 at 8 no, no. p.m.? No, 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 okay. please, no. I mean, I'm thinking, my no, gosh, I'm you've sorry. got a Superman costume yeah. somewhere if you're no. doing that. No, I'm, I'm really very lazy when it comes to uh, show days. Uh -huh. uh, I sleep in a lot. Uh, but you do have to know, where is it today? Mm. The voice is very mysterious. Mm. One day you sound like Tula the Bankhead. <laughs> the next day you sound like... Mickey Somebody Mouse. else, Mickey Mouse. <laughs> and you go, oh no, what am I going to do? And then you start the process mm -hmm. of trying to sound like Johnny Mathis. A lot of singers sing, but I'm so aware of the audience mm -hmm. that I want them to understand what I'm saying. So I have to temper my my voice, and I don't want to sound like this, you know, so I sort of, and it all goes back to my dad. My dad sang in a very, uh, uh, I call it conversational way. Mm. In other words, he wasn't so, uh, uh, so concerned with uh, the singing as, a, as he, uh, he was with the meaning of the, of the words. Mm. And, and you, you had to sing, of course. Unfortunately, it's through trial and error, and a lot of people go through the trial period and never realize the error of it mm. until it's too late. I have wonderful people that I've sung with on record mm -hmm. uh, who are brilliant singers and yeah. wonderful, and some of them have lost their voice because mm. they, they just didn't know how to do it. Yeah. And that's the joy that I get because my teacher was adamant. She says, you're going to want to do it all your life, whether you can or you can't. Is it a gift from God? Do you consider your voice just a gift? Aren't we all? <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Aren't we all? Yes. Yes. Yeah. Yes. 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 Mm -hmm. Yes. Yes. Mm -hmm. And then there's an obligation to protect it and to extend it as far as you can. If you're... <laughs> intelligent enough to have somebody smart enough around you to say, don't do that, mm -hmm. you know, yeah. Mm -hmm. And we all need it. We, I, when, when it comes easily to us, ah. we tend to take it for granted. And, mm. uh, and that's, that's when the danger starts. When you go out, and I've seen this, during Christmas concert, you'll sing a few Christmas songs and then You'll drop in at maybe the third or fourth song in the set. Chances are. Uh, why there? And do you still feel what the audience is feeling? You could, the air literally expands in the room when you hear those first chords of chances are and when you join in. What you try to do is to keep their attention at all costs. Mm. Uh, the first thing that you do when you go on stage, that I do, is make sure that you, you give them the best quality that you have vocally. Mm -hmm. So that they'll listen to anything for a while. Right. But then they get nervous. Uh -huh. 
<laughs> Don't you hate when that happens? Yeah, he's not saying so. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> it's not for me to say. When you sing that, when you sing Chances Are, mm. you're aware of the power that you and that song have <laughs> with that audience. Not really. What? I, most of the things that I'm concerned about is trying to sing it again meaningfully for the 11 millionth time <laughs> and, not, you know, and not trivialize it. And that is the hard part. It is very, very difficult to do because... I can't sing the last high part of Chances Are, for instance. Hmm. So I only sing one chorus of it, but I go from Chances Are into It's Not For Me To Say, uh -huh. and then I'll do as much of that as I can. Mm -hmm. There's no sense in ruining a performance by trying to do something that you can't do. Right. I mean, right. it's, you're never gonna be able to do it. You did it once, right. you know, <clears throat> right. let him play the record. What do you want the Johnny Mathis legacy to be? Oh my goodness. Well, you know, I was thinking about something like that, not specifically that, mm -hmm. but how soon we forget all these great, great people who come our way. And uh, it's just the way people are. So there's nothing to do about it. The thing to do is to be gracious and grateful mm -hmm. for what you have. Uh, do it for as long as you can. Uh, move on, maybe, uh, and do something else. But how do you want to be remembered? Ah. 
You've had such a long, incredible career, Johnny, and it continues. You're still recording. Mm. Life is a, is, a, is a process. I'm sure I did some awful things when I was a kid. I uh, hope nobody remembers that. Mm. <laughs> <laughs> um, and uh, when you think about people who sing, the millions and millions of people that even I listen to uh, mm. to this day, uh, it might be nice to be uh, connected uh, with that group. But mostly, I hope that my brothers and sisters um, think a little bit more about what our parents did for us. Mm. Uh, so what I do now, which is very strange for me because I was always a kid. Yeah. I even think of myself now the same way that I was when mm. I was a kid. Mm. It's kind of strange for me to have all this responsibility now mm. of being in the place of a parent to my other brothers and sisters who are still alive. Mm. And yet that's what I get the most joy out of now is what would dad do? What would mom do? Mm-hmm. You know, if they were capable. Sure, mm-hmm. sure. Yeah, so I, I spend time doing that. Tell me what's next. Fortunately, I mean, I, I'm the luckiest man in the world. Uh, it's one thing to be able to do something well, but to be able to, uh, to keep uh, everything in place, right. especially a recording contract. Unbelievable. Because the music changes so often, and, uh, and they're in the business of selling records. So I am, you know, grateful for what I had. But I'm also grateful for what I have because I have these wonderful memories. Once in a while, I'll sit down and, and re- listen to some of my recordings and I go, ah, I did that. I did that. I can't believe it. And I wonder what was the catalyst that right. made me do that? Mm-hmm. Who, who was in my life at the time that made me understand what I was doing and to make a beautiful recording like that? Yeah. Mm. What wonderful recordings he's made. 80 studio albums in all, and he's not done yet. Johnny Mathis' complete Christmas CD is in stores, as is his incredible latest Christmas album, Sending You a Little Christmas. He is still on the road, and Johnny tells me he's recording a new album with Kenny Babyface Edmonds. By the way, he'll be back next week for the Christmas show, and we might sing something together.